a bigger kick and push it harder, it will be a bigger oval. And when it's sitting still pointing straight down, it's just in the middle right there. That's a two-dimensional space. Now if I want to look at a two-dimensional pendulum, a string hanging from a point in, in space, so it can move freely this way or that way, I now have four degrees of freedom. So my phase space, which is what it's called for a pendulum, would be four-dimensional. I, I have trouble visualizing that. But you'd have velocity in this direction and that direction, and position in this direction and that direction. Uh, you could extend that concept to something like the air molecules in this room. Every molecule has a position and a velocity. So for each molecule, there are six degrees of freedom. It can be moving some direction x, y, and z. It can have some position in x, y, and z. And there's on the order of, I guess, 10 to the 26 air molecules in this room. So that would be a 6 times 10 to the 26 dimensional space. But the key is that in that ridiculously large dimensional space, one point represents the velocity and the position of every air molecule in the room. And that point moves around as molecules collide with each other, collide with the walls, change direction, and so forth. But it has rules that govern its behavior, things like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, meaning it can only go in certain places. And it's limited in the movement of that phase space. That's a much more complicated example than a granular material where we only have, you know, 10,000 particles or so. So, but small changes in configuration space can produce large changes in the macroscopic behavior. That's the key point of this. And the force chains illustrate the idea of configuration space. Okay, I want to get on the macroscopic behavior, so I want to move ahead. Um, I spent a little too much time at this part. But, um, first of all, angle of repose. In, a set, in any situation where you pour some grains, they form a pile. And that pile is basically constant angle. It grows and builds, gets bigger. Uh, illustrated here, some, some critical angle beta, beta r, the angle of repose. Typically between 23 and 38 degrees for dry grains, maybe more for wet grains. And it's a function of the surface roughness, density, particle size, dispersion, shape, relative moisture, a few other factors as well. The face of the moon isn't in there, fortunately, but it's Close. There's a lot of things that can change the, the angle of the approach. If you measure it three different days in the lab, you're going to get three different numbers. They're all in a range, but they're not the same. Uh, but what the piling of sand like this is a canonical example of what's called self organized criticality. What happens in the pile is that, say I take this pile and I smash it flat, just put a little flat spot on the top. New grains start pouring in until they reach the critical angle, and as they reach that critical angle, then they start pouring over the sides. So no matter how, whatever the previous history of the pile is, it tends to move towards that critical angle. If it's steeper than that, it'll collapse. If it's less steep than that, it'll build up until it reaches that angle. So it's self-organized criticality. It keeps itself right on the edge of this critical behavior. Where adding one particle, if I have a perfectly balanced pile here, I add one particle, it'll roll all the way down to the bottom. And another particle will roll all the way down to that first particle, and so forth. And a whole new layer builds up, and once I've done that, add one more grain and it falls down the bottom. So that's the idea of being right on the edge of that criticality. Here's an example of real life. This is a device that's dropping rocks, and it drops this pot. You can see it's very nice, even cone. Not quite perfectly straight here, but maybe that's photography issues. But the angle here is about 32 degrees. And as they keep adding rocks, the angle stays the same, it just gets bigger. Bigger out this way and bigger out that Look at the top of an orifice where we have this sort of, you know, the top of an hourglass. Instead of looking at the bottom of the pile, let's almost look at the top, the top. The top of an orifice, another set of concepts come into play. Unlike a normal fluid, the sidewalls carry some of the weight. We talked about that in microscopic behaviors. And you get a phenomenon called jamming, where a, normal, a small number of particles form a bridge that convey enough force and carry enough weight to carry the particles above them and not fall. And this happens occasionally in industrial processes where they have, um, particularly with powders, because powders jam a lot. But the orifice is small compared to the diameter of the particle. By small, I mean not more than five or ten times larger than the diameter of the particles. You can have issues with this. In, um, Industrial processes where they use grinding flow, this is a 
significant issue. Jamming causes significant delays and problems with manufacturing processes. One of the techniques to thwart it is they, they put what's called a strike plate on the side of the, the constriction. It's basically it's a big old metal plate, thick, solid, welded onto the side of the pipe. And then when they get a blockage or a jam, somebody takes a large hammer or a wrench or something and they literally hit that strike plate. They strike it and it puts a shock wave through the material that hopefully blocks, breaks the jam and it's the flow starting in. If you did that repeatedly to the pipe, the pipe would fail. So that's why they put a plate on it and take the load. Um, segregation. When I form piles, you can get segregation effects, as shown here. In this case here, the difference between the two cases is that the angle of repose is a little different for the two particles, and the grains vary in size. I'll show you on the next slide how that works. But this is what's called a Hele Shaw cell. Two plates of glass close together. You pour in grains from this end, or you can do it from the middle. They did it one sided. Pour in grains from here. And these grains initially were mixed up completely, randomized. And pour them in, and they, they form these patterns. In this case, you get strong segregation. Here, you get um, stripes. And the reason here is that, in this case here, the black particles are smaller and rougher than the white particles. They have a higher angle of repose because of the roughness. And you can see, I put this line lined up with the sort of white surface. The black particles have a higher angle of repose, but they're smaller. So the white particles can't penetrate at all, and they just fall down and end up at the bottom. The black particles will also stay at the top. It's not perfect segregation. You can see there's some black in here. There's a bit of white in here that you can see, but it's pretty good. for completely mixed up substance sorted so out this way. Over here, the red particles are larger and rougher, so they have a higher angle of repose, but they're small, but the white particles are smaller. So you see the change in the angle of repose is the white particles have a lower angle. And in that case you get segregation where you get these stripes that form. I don't know if it's much use to people in industry to form stripes like that, but that's what happens. And typically you want to mix grains and get them evenly mixed, not segregated. So these are problems that industry, people in industry worry about a lot. Another flow of interest is what's called the drum flow. Drums are used in a lot of different industrial processes for mixing. In the concrete mixers, various other, in the pharmaceutical industry, they mix things. And it's very important for their powders to be thoroughly mixed. You don't want to get one pill has 80% active ingredient, 20% filler. Another pill has 5% active ingredient, 95% filler very bad for the people taking those, those drugs. So they want a good even mixing and presents a problem in some cases. Um, but you take a drum and rotate it, you can get a steady state flow. What happens is that the surface of the drum, there's a flow, this dotted line here breaks up, separates the flowing region from the static region. Up here the particles flow down the side and then once they get here they get lodged in. As the drum rotates they stay static and rotate with the drum. So this part down here is basically a solid mass of grains that's rotating. When that gra when the grains reach the flow region, they start to flow. And because of the pattern of that flow, so you get, you know, in the middle you just get circles, get bigger and bigger, you know, circles following the drum. And then once you reach this region, you get sort of lines of flow. Things can happen. So here's the flow pattern. For example. There's four different regimes depending upon the speed of the rotation. You can get um, here you have a regime called avalanching, where there's no flow, then you reach some critical angle, beta m, the, the dynamic angle of repose, and then all of a sudden there's an avalanche, and a whole bunch of grains flow, and you get down, you get down basically to this angle, beta s, the static angle of repose. Both of these are different from the angle that a pile would form. The pile angle is between those two. And so you rotate, nothing happens, and you get an avalanche. And you wait, you rotate, and you get another avalanche. Speed it up some more, and you get a continuous flow in this region here. Speed it up further, and particles start, their, their momentum, the inertia effects of particles start to become significant. You get it, the surface starts to curve, and some of the particles at the edge become ballistic and fly into the air and fall down here, giving you this other characteristic shape. Increase the speed some more, and you get what's called um, centrifuging, where the particles stick to the wall, and their um, the acceleration up here due to the rotation is large than gravity, so they're basically stuck. They form a ring around the outside of the sound, and they, they rotate with the sun. From a physicist's point of view, that's really boring. Nothing's happening. But uh, this regime and this regime can be of particular interest to experimenters. Okay, 
Other things happen in drum flow. And segregation, after a short period of rotation, mixed particles, this is, this is about 10 rotations in simulation. It started out with a mixed state, and after about 10 rotations, all the reds are in the middle and almost all the yellows are on the outside. And this also happens in other phenomena. Um, th these flower patterns are created for the same result, but at a very particular speed of rotation. The difference between A and B, they're the same cells with the same material inside it, different rates of rotation. The random rotation is tuned in a certain way, you get these flower petal patterns. Uh, over much longer time scales, you also get axial segregation, or bands form. And these bands also exhibit what's called a coarsening behavior. This is, this is say, you know, a few hundred rotations to form these. This is like 10,000 or 20,000. And if you went to a few million rotations, you would end up with, you can see this black on the side walls, you'd end up with a black band here, a black band there, and white in the middle. So the stripes would get thicker and thicker, and fewer and fewer in number as the material segregated further axially. I also have a demonstration for that. This is a mixture I've made of white sand and blue glass beads. I try to mix it up as randomly as I can to get it thoroughly mixed. And if you start rotating, simply by the easiest way is to roll it on a tabletop. If you rotate after about three or four, four rotations, you'll notice that there's a nice solid core in the middle here that has virtually no blue particles at all, and they all seem to be on the edge. And that's a that's a physical example of segregation. I'm going to pass this around, you all can take a look at it. There's even more segregation on this surface because of the different coefficient of friction there. And you see a lot of the particles on the outside on this surface, and very high density of blue particles. I flip it on its side right now, they stay there. You can, get, you can find the white cores as well. So I'm going to play with that, send it around. I'll open it up. Um, one thing I meant to mention earlier that I was kind of remiss on, uh, phases. Granular materials can exhibit roughly corresponding phases of solid, liquid, or gas. Right now it's kind of a solid, it's just sitting there, not really moving at all, holding a shape. If I shake it around a little bit, it sloshes and moves like a liquid and seeks the bottom of the container. And if I shake it harder, now it's behaving like a gas. The particles are bouncing around and bouncing off each other and are basically in free flight most of the time. So all three phases matter can be sort of modeled like that in the but it's a function of energy input. The interactions are dissipative. When the sand crashes into itself, it loses energy because of friction. So it eventually settles to the solid state unless there's a constant energy input. Okay, segregation in drums. Pattern formation. Take a cell, put a thin layer of particles in it, vibrate it up and down like this, vacuum the air. You get all kinds of patterns that form as a result of the interaction between the grains. Stripe pattern, there's a hexagon, there's also a square pattern that you have an illustration of. This is a region where the sand is fairly flat. Uh, you can imagine that the sand is bouncing up and down, the plate's bouncing up and down, and the sand is like a loose ball. I could find a frequency where I throw it up, and then it goes up, and then it comes down, and the plate basically catches it again. That gives you sort of a flat region like this. But then it's it's doing what's called a subharmonic behavior. For every two cycles of the plate, the sand goes up and down once. So it could be going up and down on cycle A or cycle B. That's what happened here. This side is on one cycle, that side is on the other, in the region in the middle, high activity is called the kink. There's a lot of interesting dynamics that I don't have time to go into now, but I talked about quickly. They're not related to vibrational modes of the container like chalabi patterns. These are something completely different. They form spontaneously in the pattern. And you can get square patterns in a round cell and so forth. Okay, uh, the ocelons are also formed as an isolated.